Glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. There is power in the utterance of the Holy Ghost. Great power. Untapped power. Undreamed of power. I believe that knowledge is a great enemy of the fulfillment of God's purpose today. Do not deceive yourself and think that you can learn and learn so much and then fulfill God's purpose. <clears throat> Hallelujah. You might like to open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 14. God is dealing with me about this man Caleb. Hallelujah. Then the children of Judah, chapter 14 and verse 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord sent unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture. For in this scripture is expressed to me in a gripping manner the romance of being laid hold of by God. And really what Caleb is saying here is, Moses, remember, he's employing a retrospective, he's looking back. I was resting up at the house and a phrase of a chorus of some of the, some of the sons of God used to sing kept going through my mind and through my mind. So give me this mountain. I've claimed it for years. Though the giants do dwell there, I'm possessed of no fears. The voice of the sons in dominion declare, the earth is the Lord. Lords, let his enemies flee. But that first line kept going through my mind. Give me this mountain. I've claimed it for years. And as I look back, when I received the Holy Ghost over 19 years ago, it's probably about this time of the year. I don't know what, whether it was or not, but the first sermon I can ever remember preaching was about Caleb and Joshua out of the experience in Numbers chapter 14, 13 and 14. Brother Tony and I were talking about what God has done this afternoon. And as we talked about God's mighty acts in this last generation, the power of God came down mightily in that office, didn't it? And we were seized upon by God's holy presence. Hallelujah. These are tremendous days, aren't they? This is a tremendous week in God. He's reviving us. He's causing us to remember. And remembering... Our desire goes out to God. I would just like to make a, a little explanation. Some of the people of the present movement, some of my friends, sort of chastise me for remembering the past as kind of a hark back to ancient history of what God did in 1948, 
what God did in 1906. And I, I felt a little ashamed of myself for, for talking about the things of the past and looking back. And the Lord has dealt with me since. One thing I've always noticed is when I talk about God's mighty acts in the past, His presence seizes me in the now. And so that tells me God is pleased. And I realize now and I see clearly that I have not done wrong in remembering what God has done. For I'm not remembering as someone who has retired into an armchair resting on his laurels, for I have never yet seen the great victories of the move of God that I was born for. And I've had a consciousness ever since I was saved that I was born for a visitation or a revival or a move of God, an awakening, whatever you want to call it. And I, I want to magnify, in this moment, the power of remembrance. Hallelujah. There is power in remembrance, in retrospective. And it's not hard to prove that. I just want to turn to a couple of Paul's utterances. The general theme of what I'm talking about tonight might be going on under perfection. Going on under perfection. And the meaning of perfection is defined in going on. For the perfection that the New Testament talks about is the teleological quality of God, that he is a goal-oriented mind, that God has a definite purpose in view, and he will fully overtake that and bring about a total consummation and a satisfying fulfillment. I emphasize to you that the desire you have in your spirit tonight of spiritual hunger is there because it was designed to be fulfilled in you. You are not being tantalized by a cruel God or a cruel fate. Hallelujah. Can you accept that? I'm just going to read. Paul especially uses this remembrance, this retrospective in the epistles to Timothy. And we could look into 1 Timothy in chapter 1. Looking in the wrong epistle. Chapter 1 and verse 18. When Paul says to Timothy, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Paul is reminding Timothy of a word that is going to figure powerfully in his life. An essential word. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Second Timothy. We find a great deal of this retrospective, this looking back. And I was just listening to one of the world's greatest teachers, a man who's dead now. A couple weeks ago, as Brother Serge and I rode in the car, we were given a couple tapes, and all the tapes I've ever listened to, you could just about count on all your fingers and toes my whole life. Praise God, but... God brought this about, and I felt on our trip on the turnpike, we just put it in the recorder and listened, because this man was about 80 when he spoke it, had one of the clearest visions of the century, and he dwelled on this aspect, that Paul, foreseeing a tremendous change coming to the church, a change for the worse, then he puts Timothy in remembrance of those things he had received in the better days of the church. Look at chapter 1 of 2 Timothy and see this term of remembrance here. I don't know exactly where I should read. Paul's introductions are so hard to start with. Uh, I guess I'll read verse 3 and some others. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience. You see, even Paul's opening statement is retrospective. That without ceasing I have remembrance of thee, personal remembrance, the power of it. 
I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which first dwelt in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the greatest of all, hallelujah. Pardon me while I shout. Hallelujah, Lord. Glory to God. Thou art great, O Lord. Hallelujah. My God, hallelujah. The power of the remembrance as we remember the saints that have trod the battlefield of God. Hallelujah. Blessed be your holy name. Glory to God. I can't wait for a future release. I've got to shout now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Pardon me for falling up the decibel level there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. When the praise and the glory and the worship builds up within you, it's not there to turn stagnant, but it's there to be released. Because when I began to remember this special person, something happened in the marrow of my bones. Look in chapter 2 and verse 8. I just want to pick out several words here, and I'm not doing violence to the scripture. Chapter 2 and verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> How can you ever remember him without a thrill of excitement running through your being? And really, what I think Paul is doing here, because the church was changing and taking a wrong turning, and knowledge played a profound role in this alteration that took place. Gnosis, Gnostic systems of, of speculative theology, Gnostic heresy, which finally placed Jesus somewhere in a hierarchy of powers, but not at the top. There were several, or maybe many, beyond him and their scheme. But remember Jesus Christ. And I think what Paul is saying is here, remember the true gospel. Remember his entire redemptive passion. And at a time like this, when we're suffering the winds of doctrine that are almost tornadic in force and in destructive effect, this is a time to remember the Christ of the Gospels. Back to Jesus Christ. I say back to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. When I sat for eight years in Bethesda Missionary Temple in Detroit and Mrs. Beale, Sister Beale, whom I regard as one of the six greatest ministers of the century, when she told the story of the latter rain outpouring, my wife will bear witness, at no other time did God's power so mightily fill that temple as when she told the story of how the rain began to fall and we would be imbued with God's presence in a marvelous way. I'd love to hear her tell tonight if I could. I never get tired. I never get tired hearing that to which the Holy Ghost witnesses with his power. Hallelujah. I was just looking at Sister Beverly and Brother Tony and myself, and we're three simple people, aren't we? Amen? We're three simple people. Praise God. Remember Jesus Christ. His teachings couldn't hold a candle to these teachers of today for complexity and bafflement and confusion. <laughs> but Jesus Christ could bring you to a decision. Hallelujah. In fact, Jesus is the 
frustration of teachers of all the ages. How could a man come using agricultural symbolism and allegory and metaphor and, and say the simple things he did? And I cannot imagine, and I'm a very imaginative person, I cannot imagine a teacher ever approaching Jesus. One time I heard, a few months back, a little Pennsylvania Dutchman came, little Adam Weaver. And I think of all the men I ever heard in my life, he's the only one. He gave us a parable from the farm. And I was amazed the profundity in the simplicity. Profundity and simplicity go together. John Wright Follett taught many, many parables from nature. Hallelujah. So, remember Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And in saying, remember Jesus Christ, he's saying, remember the sacred salvation history. And you know, like Caleb, after you've lived a while, and he had lived 45 years since the day he's remembering, that after you've lived a while, you have what we call a history. And you can look back and you can realize that you've learned some things by experience. That's the only real learning there is, experiential learning. You know, after all of these years and the product of European high culture and uh, the great violinistic tour de forces that were done by Paganini Virtal and many other great uh, European virtuosi, somebody in Japan came up with a new method and they make the young violinists play by imitation. And they don't learn to read music until about the level of playing a Mozart concerto, and then they learn to read music after that. They learn to play by imitation, and they're producing probably the greatest crop of virtuosi the world has ever seen. Hallelujah. They're learning by doing. Hallelujah. And uh, I've learned a lot in my history of all the things I've done wrong. I believe in learning them and perceiving God is saying, don't do them again. Quit that. I took an Italian course a few years ago and the teacher told me something comical about how the parents in Italy treat children. And this is what he said. It's kind of unbelievable. But the parent in Italy says to the child, you're dumb. Go to school, listen to the teacher. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're dumb. Go to school and listen to the teacher. <laughs> That's insulting, isn't it? That was a daring thing to say just now, but I had to say it. Praise God. It's too good to let go by. But it applies to all of us. It applies to all of us. How many have done something dumb just in their recent future? The recent past. The recent past. You know, as you go in this life, God tightens up the reins on you. I notice one thing the Lord's doing with me is I have to be careful how I give personal testimony now. Sometimes, you know, years ago, I could do this and that, and the Lord, I guess, winked at it, or he thought I was cute, you know, a little kid. <laughs> but now, get up and say some of the same things and get smitten in my spirit by the Lord. <laughs> Just like a knife, a dagger stabs through. And when that happens, I know I've got to stop that line of teaching or preaching right then and seek, you know, the better channel of the Spirit. Hallelujah. I love this story, don't you? Isn't this a tremendous story? I just wanted to establish about remembrance there. And uh, there are a couple statements in the Psalms that I think I'd like to dig out. Some that I used just recently even. Blessed be God. Hallelujah. Psalm 42, 6. Hallelujah. Preaching on that a little while ago. I'm not going to preach on that whole section of Scripture tonight. Where David says, Have you ever asked this question? How about you, Sister Sylvia? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? <laughs> <laughs> or how many ever had a soul here that never got cast down? Anybody here have a soul that never got cast down? I think one of the most pathetic characteristics of the human being is our soul gets so quickly cast down. And I believe God is in the business of making a people today whose souls don't get cast down anymore. 
in the power of the resurrection life of Jesus, their souls do not get cast down. Hallelujah. I heard a great healer make a statement on the platform years ago. And when he said it, I guess I, he flabbergasted me. I almost had to laugh at him. He said something like, it is impossible for me to doubt in that which was he, he was functioning and in doing. You know, when you got a tent up and there's 10,000 people coming to you every night and there's cancers and goiters and tumors and demons and, and insanity, I, I think maybe the man was telling the truth because if he, ha if he had have been uh, doubting in a thing, I believe he would have folded his tent up and sold the trucks and the trailers and the chairs and gone to sell insurance. You're either going to overcome that thing where you are or it's going to overcome you. And so I can see no reason why tonight, why if it is possible to doubt, it is also possible that it be impossible to doubt. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, Peter walked on the water at the Lord's invitation. He walked a while and then he looked on sermon as he began to sink and then the Lord lifted up and then he walked back to the boat. He didn't sink anymore. Something must have clicked that made it impossible to doubt as he walked the water. How is it that we can speak in tongues by, by faith? Is it not that we have overcome doubt in this area? Is it not? Is it not that speaking in other tongues has become a mastered principle with us, that we know what spiritual switches to flip, that we can do this impossible thing? And this is impossible, if it's real, hallelujah. And it's real in some cases, hallelujah. Glory to God, in many cases. Foreign languages we never learned. I have already, with my natural ear and understanding, understood some of the tongues that I've heard spoken. I've heard Latin dialect spoken by at least two people. One of them was Kathy Kennedy, who was in the class with who? With you, Bonnie? When he'd speak in tongues, I could partially understand him with my natural understanding. It happened to be a language that I have studied some about. That makes you feel real funny to hear the Holy Ghost talking over here and you're understanding him without any intervening interpretation gifts or anything. It's a, it's a strange experience. It, feel, it makes you feel very near to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. If God just smiles upon us, then I will be helped, and our souls that are cast down will be lifted. O oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. When it is, sometimes it's in order to confess it, evidently. Here it is. Therefore will I remember thee. Why? that we might get more cast down? No, that we might remember God's mighty works and the remembrance of it might begin to lift us from the land of Jordan and from the hill from, of the Hermonites and from the hill Mizar. This is when David was driven out of Jerusalem. He had to remember the Lord because his soul was tending to get cast down within him. Then there's another scripture, one that I used even a few weeks ago. I've used it many times really. In Psalm 63, verses 1 and 2, O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. This is the time to seek Him, children, in the beginning of your experience. Almost all of you in this room are just a few years old in the Lord, isn't that right? Yeah. Many of you, many of the younger ones. This is the time to seek Him. When I came into this, uh, this great kingdom matter some years ago, I began to seek the Lord with a tremendous fury, and with a tremendous passion and a drive and a singleness of purpose. And I can look back now and I know this, that that was the only opportunity in life I ever had to seek him that way. My life is not according to the same pattern today, but there was a, a pressing in as the Pentecostals used to exhort in those days which I submitted myself to, and I see now that those days will never come again. Those days for pressing in, those days were ordained for that thing. Praise God. And among other things God did for me at that time, I had an experience like David right here. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory 
so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. One taste of God's glory begets a thirst for another taste, and another, and another, and another, until we learn to drink daily at those wellsprings of living water. Hallelujah. And I can't remember when it was specifically, but it was in my beginnings that I was in Cleveland, Ohio, and saw the visible Shekinah glory cloud appear before my eyes. And the church that John D. Rockefeller went to when he lived in Cleveland, I think it was the First Baptist Church. Anyway, it's a big Baptist church downtown Cleveland, and these healing brethren rented it, and they were in there, and I think it was a Thursday night, the visible glory appeared in a most tremendous manifestation of God. And you know, how can I look back upon that night and not hunger and thirst to see his glory again? That's what David's saying here. The power of retrospective, the power of looking back. The power of looking back, not to the defeats of life and not to the ordinary grind of daily life, not to the tedium of earthly existence, but back to the times of divine intervention, hallelujah, when heaven was on earth. Praise God, hallelujah. Days of heaven on earth it was when God was healing the sick from 1946 through 1956. Even the great Dr. Baxter says, those were the best days of my life, the best years of my life. Hallelujah. 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 Gordon Lindsay, I don't know who coined the phrase, but it was cried in the land. Bible days are here again. All days really are Bible days, but they were days like when Jesus walked in his flesh and there was a Christ ministry where the sick were being healed and many terminal cancer cases were taken. And I remember sitting, it must have been that same meeting in Cleveland the, the day before, in the afternoon meeting, I was sitting, sitting in there and they brought a woman in on a stretcher that had cancer and her flesh was greenish white, greenish whitish yellow. I can't see anything quite the color of what she was in this place. And I saw one of the men that were moving in the acting power of the Holy Ghost Amen. as he preached his sermon. And he wasn't much of a preacher. He was a West Virginia boy, an Irish fellow from down south. And he came over and ministered to that woman. And I was watching her. Within 10, 15 minutes, I saw her flesh turning pink before my very eyes. Hallelujah. I saw the transformation of Jesus' life getting into that woman and changing her from what she was to what Jesus Christ is. Hallelujah. I've, see, I've seen it with my eyes, and I've been in the atmosphere. I've tasted deeply of it. Do you think I can be satisfied to live through a powerless era of time? No. But something in my spirit demands. Hallelujah. When faith touches God, it makes a demand. When the woman touched Jesus, it has been rendered in some translation, I perceive someone touched me, for someone has made a demand on my ability. Someone tapped into his capacity of divine life and healing. <coughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I just love this whole idea. Caleb coming up to Joshua and says, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kaddish, Barnea. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Forty years old was I when Moses, a servant of the Lord, sent me from Kaddish Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. I think I feel like turning back there to that story. Hallelujah. Praise God. Numbers, probably chapter 14 tells us in Deuteronomy 33 and 1 that Moses sent these spies from Kaddish Barnea. Last night, we dealt with some negative aspects and some positive aspects, and we came to chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah, into the very temple of the Lord, and saw the Lord high and lifted up. Tonight, we're re reinforcing that idea, saying, remember Jesus Christ. And I want, to remember, I want to remind you also that Jesus Christ came into the world in the guise of the prophetic word for many centuries. Is that right? That that word that came to all the patriarchs and prophets was Christ. 
And the rock that followed them in the wilderness, the Bible specifically states in Corinthians, that rock that followed them was Christ. The angel of the Lord that ministered to them was Christ. That which has come to man down through the ages from the throne of God is Christ, the living word. He is the spokesman of the Godhead. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. Do you will to go on in your hearts this night? Do you will to go on? A.B. Simpson said, true religion resides in the will alone. That statement that he made and I picked up years ago has remained with me. Because I want to tell you a little secret about us and our, our silly, flimsy, psychic selves. After this night, it won't be long till every last one of us is going to feel like turning back. We're going to feel like giving up. We're going to feel like throwing in the sponge. And when you feel like giving up and yielding and putting the white flag of surrender up, then you go by your sanctified will. And by your mind, it has divine principles built in it from Scripture. You go by that and live by that. And wait out those cloudy days, for the sunshine of His grace will surely break through again. Hallelujah. 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 Where shall I read here? They sent the, they sent the spies over to see the land. And they went over and they saw some giants. Praise God. They saw some big hindrances to their plans, big hindrances to the purpose of God. How many of you have seen looming on your spiritual horizon some giants that stalk the horizon like great hawking beasts? You know, like one of these horror movies they make, you know, they want to introduce you to the monster with real dramatic impact and they begin to beat on the timpani. And, you know, I remember the movie Mighty Joe Young years ago, how. They, they, they cause this tremble, tremulous feeling by using the timpani and suddenly you get a sight of the beast, the monster, and it sends a thrill of fear through the whole audience. <laughs> Praise God. You aren't in this way long until you look out on the horizon and you see, oh, there's a lot of names for them, the Amalekites. What else is it called? The children of Anak were there. Even Anak sounds like a gigantic name, doesn't it? Ah! <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Great, great demonic forms that grunt and and snort and terrify you in the night. Stalk through your nightmares, coming in the form of beasts, wild beasts and serpents and all those things. Yes, there are principalities and powers in the heavenlies. And when we begin to ascend in the Lord Jesus Christ, we bump up against them and we trouble them. Brother Sergio was telling me a tremendous experience he had over in Hamilton, Ontario about, oh, maybe 15 years ago. And his calling is that of warfare. When he was eight years old, the prophet laid hands on him in Grosseto, Italy, and said, Your name is not Sergio, but David, and you shall slay many Goliaths. And you are a prophet to the nations. And that's a true prophecy. I got the witness yet today. Hallelujah. As soon as he said it, God witnessed that was a true prophecy. When the prophecy is true, it will not fail you in the hour of stress. Praise God. And he preached that night, and the people ascended in worship into a high realm, into a realm where he knew by his uh, general understanding that they had shaken the principalities and powers. And after the service, when he had to drive back to his home in Pennsylvania, several hundred mile trip, as he came out of Canada that night, suddenly the spiritual heavens unfolded before him. The, the material heavens just rolled back like a scroll, and he saw the reality of the spiritual heavens and he saw the entire sky filled with writhing serpents, just intertwined and writhing and agitated like this. The whole panorama of the sky was filled with great serpents, and they were agitated. Something had agitated them. He knew it was the meeting they had. And he said, just for a moment, a flicker of fear crossed the, uh, went across his being, and then out of his mouth burst forth holy laughter, and he laughed at them. That's the meaning of Jesus' work on the cross. We laugh at Satan. We laugh at the unclean spirits. We laugh at the whole range of principalities, powers, thrones, and dominions. For Jesus Christ is supreme over all. And I don't know, I can't understand the mechanics, but all I know is this, the Bible has persuaded me 
that all that was necessary to be done to undo Satan and to reduce him to nil effectiveness was done by Jesus. It's done. And that a child of God enlightened as to the scriptures can defeat Satan anywhere, anytime, on any ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? Amen. Hallelujah. You see, we have a, an alternative before us, much like Caleb tonight. We have the alternative of letting our fears take over and take us to everlasting defeat. Mm. Or just like this song said, I thought how appropriate everything was that was sung tonight to the whole idea that I'm preaching. Again, that beautiful harmony. Cast aside your every doubt and fear. Hallelujah. That's the price you pay. Cast aside your doubt and fear. Overcome self. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, ten of the spies brought a bad report and brought immediate fear. They, they were operating under a spirit of fear, and a spirit of fear is a contagious thing. A spirit of fear will run through an audience just like a flash of lightning. When I was down at Brothers Valori's last, last year in the winter, I don't know when it was now, but we went to, he took us to a steakhouse to eat before the Saturday night meeting. And while we were there, that, that steakhouse caught on fire and burnt down. And we were clear at the back, at the back wall, and the front door was way up there. It was almost twice as long as this room. And we were at the back, and I was seated right by the back wall, and the fire started right up above our heads. All of a sudden, it began to be snapping and popping sounds. And then all of a sudden, a strange feeling, like when you clean an electric oven and turn it up to 900 degrees, that odd feeling of intense heat. And all of a sudden, a man that was seated over there from me, he stood up, and in a, a voice that... They contributed alarm. He said, the restaurant's on fire. And when he said that, I saw the operation of the spirit of fear. That entire people, just like a herd of cattle, just went into a stampede. But some men got control of the whole thing and settled it down, and we filed up. My brother Roy Jacobson had gone to the bathroom, and I went over and opened the door, and I said, there's brother Roy, the sedate Norwegian. I said, Roy, the restaurant's on fire. <laughs> I'll never forget the stunned look on his face. He didn't react with fear. I think he thought I was telling him a joke. <laughs> he stood there and he looked at me. But we went out very orderly. I, by the grace of God, had eaten my whole meal. And <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. And that restaurant was gutted. I don't know but what the devil might have set on fire to destroy us back in there because we were all the way at the back. Because there were some men with revelation. One of the sisters almost became hysterical. Jesus was on the, in, asleep in the boat and the sea was whipped into a frenzy. And I believe that, that most Bible scholars believe that was a demonic intent to destroy him. I can't remember where it is now, but I believe that it says somewhere, at least this is the essence, Jesus was asleep for confidence. Confidence in his heavenly Father. You know, really, this whole issue of today and the, uh, the crux of the matter and the pivotal point is a theological problem. It all boils down to whether we believe that the Father has the character that the Bible attributes to him. If he is the one the Bible describes so clearly, then we have nothing to fear. But if the Bible is not reliable, then we are walking in darkness. I choose to believe the Bible. I choose to believe the Bible. Hallelujah. What do you choose to believe? Sense evidence? The failures of your life that you don't know what to attribute to? I choose to believe the pages of Holy Writ. Hallelujah. And so after the people brought fear on the whole congregation, look at chapter 13 of Numbers. I want to read something here. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. There is Walter Butler's principle of instantaneous, unquestioning obedience. If, the, if God tells you to do something and you hesitate on it, chances are you're going to lose the day. Instantaneous, unquestioning obedience. Walter Buehler was a specialist in the area of guidance and obe obedience to God. In fact, I don't know whether you know it or not, but Walter Buehler was a tremendous offense to the Pentecostal movement. And right now, today, in his group, which is the Assemblies of God, you will hear him widely spoken evil of. Brother Hubert Bunny was here. He's an Assembly of God pastor and has a Bible school. 
in western Pennsylvania, and he was telling me that many places he goes, he hears people speaking against Walter Butler. If you obey God, for some reason, it will offend the flesh in the church. And Brother B Bunny told me this. He said, I hear somebody defending Brother Butler and besmirching his, his uh, remembrance. And I say, did you ever know the man? And he said, no. I said, well, why don't you keep your mouth shut then? You don't know what you're talking about. You see, Butler's doctrine was conservative, but he was radical in obedience to God. And God led him in strange ways. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You have a price to pay if you walk in the Spirit and do some uh, exploits in the Lord. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we, are, for we are well able to overcome it. And then the other man brought on the contrary opinion again. Let me see in verse in chapter 14 now. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We can see two different things here, two different spirits operating. In the 10, we can see the spirit of rebellion. In verse 9 of chapter 14, Caleb and Joshua cry, only rebel ye not against the Lord. That's the spirit of rebellion. It was in the 10. And it passed like wildfire through the rest of the congregation. The Bible specifically states to us in Deuteronomy, I guess it's chapter 32. Let's see if I can find it just now. Somewhere here, I believe that's the place. Bible states, praise God. I don't see it just now, but it's, it states of Caleb and Joshua, God said, they have wholly followed me. They were totally obedient. Hallelujah. Look at verse 9 of chapter 14. Caleb and Joshua say, only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the, the people of the land, for they are bread for us. In other words, the difficulty that you so greatly fear is the trouble that brings enlargement. Just sister, sister Moore teaching a while back on the principle that trouble brings enlargement. The difficulty of overcoming the giants was designed by God in their salvation history to make spiritual giants out of them. In overcoming physical giants, they would become spiritual giants. That's a principle in God. It is even seen in the meteorological realm in, that, in this fact that a great storm always arises against a headwind. The greater storms of power and fury always have winds pressing against them, and it's the contrary pressure of wind that causes the clouds and the storm and the power to build high up into the atmosphere. Storms that have winds with them are not storms of great power. And if this resistance we're experiencing in our generation is any key to the outcome, we're going to see something tremendous, Brother Tony. We're going to see heaven's thunder and lightning striking. Hallelujah. We're going to see heaven's tornadoes go into action. We're going to see a hurricane of God's power as God's great storm of redemption and judgment rises against the headwinds of demonic and human opposition. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The prophetic horizon is piled high with clouds that are black and lowering, full of judgment for the wicked and rebellious, and full of the grace of redemption for those that obey the Lord and all that he has said. Hallelujah. Fear, neither fear you the people of the land. Don't fear the inhabitants of this supernatural realm. There are powers that be that have inhabited this realm for ages, maybe eons. But Jesus Christ has come forth with his people to displace those principalities and powers. Hallelujah. They are bread for us. They are bread for us. We would rather have that ice cream cone that Brother Taylor talks about. God did not call us to overcome ice cream cones. Hallelujah. If everything goes your way in life, the way your carnal thinking would like, then what is there to overcome? And if there's nothing to overcome, what's going to develop your spiritual muscles? You know, I saw Paul Anderson, the world's strongest man. He built his power by the deep knee bend, or the full squat, going to the level of squatting with 1,200 pounds on the bar on his back. Built a set of thighs that are over 36 inches apiece. And I was reading an interview with Brother Paul. He's a Christian, you know. He's a preacher and a 
testifies for Jesus. And somebody was interviewing him a while back about this great power that he developed and how he did it with the deep nevens. You know what he said in that article? He said, I hated every set of them I ever did. <laughs> he said, the problem with 1,200 pounds isn't that my legs can't handle it, that it crushes my body. Can you imagine 1,200 pounds on your back, squatting with it? Practically twice as strong as any other man in history has ever been. And he's a Christian. I'm glad the strongest man on the earth is a believer, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> My wife's brother was telling us about seeing him on TV on You Ask For It or some show, or maybe it was Billy Graham. He, he's a minister with Billy Graham, and Paul Anderson approached the audience this way. He's a mar remarkable character. He's about as tall as I am. He weighs 400 pounds. And he strode out before the people, and he's rather bold, as you might expect. And he went like this. He said, I am the strongest man in the world. He said, and I need Jesus. Amen. What about you puny people out there? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let us remember when we get mighty in God, and we've seen some exploits. Let us remember what Paul said to Timothy. Remember Jesus. You still need him. Praise God. Hallelujah. Remember Jesus. You still need him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Jesus, we've got to stop and praise you. For your overshadowing reality impinges upon our every sense. Oh, Lord, and we know that you are near. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Oh, Blessed be the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. You know, I'm not done preaching, but I'm, I'm having a real odd idea come into my head. I feel like singing something. And I can't sing, that's the funny part. It's in my heart, it's in my heart. We were singing it down at Corvella. How many of you people here know that little chorus, Jesus is here, Jesus is here? My heart tells me that Jesus is, is here. You know that? Hallelujah. Anybody else know it? Sister Bobby knows it. My wife knows it. So, so, yeah. Anybody else know? I would just, we, I just like to pause and sing that because we sense the Lord's presence. Hallelujah. Let's do that. Let's have an interlude. You know, the prophecy of Jericho of Isaiah. For it means a holy place in the wilderness of wandering. It was the place of divine apprehension of Caleb and Joshua's lives for the purpose of God to go in and possess the land. For it is in a holy place in God's holy temple, in a meeting with God, that God will indelibly impress upon you the meaning of life, which is your mission, your ministry of Jesus Christ. The reason why God brought the prophets into their ministries with a tremendous initial vision and a high order of experience is that it would evermore be imbued upon their remembrance, the call of God that would be unforgettable in its power to motivate their lives unto the fulfillment of their mission. And Caleb shows that he had not been lax in remembering the word of the Lord. For it is the very word of the Lord to you that carries within it the seeds of fulfillment. For it is said that every word from God carries within it the power of self-fulfillment. That's partly the meaning of Isaiah chapter 55. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. And in the book of the Judges, the scripture we used last week concerning Gideon, the angel of the Lord appeared unto this man Gideon and said to Gideon, chapter 6 and verse 12, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And in a moment of time, Gideon's self-identity began to change. 
perhaps not as drastically and not as, in a, as revolutionarily as God might have hoped. But immediately Gideon began to see himself in a new light as the word of God was spoken over his life personally for the first time. And the Lord looked upon Gideon in verse 14 and said to Gideon, Go in this thy might. He is saying, Go in the power of this word. Live your life under the impact of the power of the word of God from this moment forward. Go in this new identification in the eternal mind of your God and you will be the conqueror. You will act the mighty man of valor. Hallelujah. Do, do you believe that? Do you believe that? That is so. That is so. Go in this thy might. For 45 years in our story, Caleb has been going in this his might. The very thing the Lord said unto Moses and through Moses, a man of God, about him. The New Testament says somewhere, Thou wilt perfect that which concerneth me. Hallelujah. Isn't this marvelous? Praise the Lord. He said, My brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, praise God, when the prophet of the Lord began to swear back in that dispensation, you'd better look out. Because that word that was sworn by the power of the Holy Ghost anointing was the word that was sure to come to pass. He said, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now after 45 years, Caleb sees the goal in sight. Hallelujah. Caleb's name in Hebrew means forcible. And that reminds me of the scripture, I guess I won't even turn to it, it's in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. And I want to give this rendering of it. <clears throat> it seems to be the best rendering the translators have been able to come up with. It's a, it's a difficult scripture to translate, they say. But Jesus said one day, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven is pushing itself with force and the violent are taking it as a booty. And though this scripture is controversial among theologians, I believe what is implied is this, that when the kingdom of God advances itself in this earth, at that leading edge of the kingdom, there is a tremendous agitation set up as it overcomes devils, as it heals sicknesses and diseases, as it raises the dead. And there is a tremendous warfare. And except you are a violent man and a violent woman, and you set your will to possess this thing that you have seen, you will become a casualty on the battlefield. You've got to become violent, and you've got to press. You've got to lay hold. You've got to apprehend. And it's got to be with all the vigor of your spiritual being. You can't be lax with God. You can't put your hand in the pile and then look back. You'll disqualify yourself. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. You know, Caleb is looking back over a history of the dealings of God and his salvation. And it was 19 years ago this January that I was moved by God in the first leading of God I was ever aware of in my life that I could classify, that I could isolate as a definite guidance and leading. And God kept me awake night after night as I sought the baptism of the Holy Ghost and God was showing me I had to go to Phoenix, Arizona to A.A. Allen's big gospel tent to the winter camp meeting that was held in January where many of the old time Pentecostals from the mountains out west all gathered together and many of the Navajo Indians were there. And I didn't want to go. But I did want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I did want God. And so after lying awake for a number of nights, and I actually believed I couldn't receive guidance from God, but I was getting it anyway. I thought I was too thick-headed, too stubborn, too resistant, too thick-skinned. And I went out there to Phoenix, Arizona. I rode the train 
I couldn't make arrangements for people to travel with me. And I got there on a Wednesday night when the service was over. I got there nearly at midnight. And I asked the Lord on the way out to give me the baptism in the first night service I was in. <clears throat> I went to the prayer tent and I prayed all night. It was cold on the desert in the 30s, I believe. I fortunately had an overcoat because it was winter back here in the east. Wrapped up in my overcoat or whatever I had there, I guess that's what it was. Prayed all night. There were a lot of saints in the prayer tent. They had those old kerosene heaters going and heated the tent. Kind of stunk. But a lot of people prayed all night. There were a lot of saints who were seeking the Lord desperately out there. They were meant in business with God. They were doing business with God. Next morning, I had a service. Brother Douglas ministered. About 200 people fell under the power of God. It was a tremendous anointing present. And I was there and couldn't feel anything. And I know the power of God was moving now. But I couldn't feel anything. But I had told the Lord the first night service. And I forgot what I said. And I felt bad after seeing a couple hundred. And they lay under the power for hours at that time. There was a heavy anointing. For hours and hours they were on their backs under the power. So that afternoon I went. Found a public gymnasium or something. And got in a place and got cleaned up. I had no money. No room. Nothing. No way to eat. Nothing. Just cast Loose on the sea of God, drifting in God, hallelujah. Drifting in the sea of God, hallelujah. I think I had change in one pocket, maybe three dollars, but you know, I hated to spend it because that's all there was. No bills at all. Took all the money to buy the train ticket, it was about ninety-five dollars at that time. And I went to this, I got cleaned up and the devil sent a messenger to me, a young fellow that was a psychic wreck. He had demonic powers in his life. And he took a liking to me and he stuck to me like a leech all day. He really bugged me. You know that every time you're near to God and near to a breakthrough, the devil will send an emissary. This is a principle. You get ready. When you're near, when you're near at hand for a great event in life, the devil often sends an emissary. I've had it happen more than once. I finally shook him off. Just to give you an idea of how mixed up he was, he was from Topeka, Kansas, where the first outpouring happened in 1901. His mother said that God told her to kill his father. And they accepted that as being from God. That's how far off you can get. That's how far off you can get, if you're not careful. They seriously accepted that. And he told me these things, and I shook him somehow, and that night was Thursday night. During the meeting, there were about 8,000 of us present. The Holy Ghost, I remember, came from that corner of the tent and swept over like a mighty wind. And as, as the Holy Ghost swept, the people responded like a waving field of wheat. It's marvelous to see a great multitude under the Holy Ghost. Tommy Hicks looked out over 400,000 souls being wrought upon by the Holy Spirit. That must have been a marvelous sight in history. And we stood to our feet as God moved through to honor his holy presence. And then the people started one of those old-time Jericho marches, and we marched around that great aisleway of the tent. And many, many preachers laid hands on us, maybe 20, 30, 40, including some of the famous ones. But still, I didn't feel anything. I had my little Schofield Bible, and I, I was seeking the Lord, and uh, I was praising the Lord. I had memorized some biblical praises. I didn't have any praise in me, really, so I memorized some phrase out of the Bible, and I was praising the Lord that way. And some of the out of Revelation, you know. And I had my little scope of Bible and I raised my hands. I was doing what the Pentecostals told me to do. Put your hands up in the air. Hallelujah. Put your lightning rods up, they used to say. <laughs> lightning will strike out of heaven. Put your lightning rods up. There may be a reality in that. You know, over in the Acts class there uh, two years ago, Sister Mary Fiore saw a vision one day. And she saw a group of people on a bench in a park. And all of a sudden it began to rain fire out of heaven. And they all instinctively put their umbrellas up to keep God off of them. But God burned his way through the umbrella. <laughs> when God starts moving, men put up theological umbrellas to protect themselves against God and to try to contain the power of God in safe limits. But the power of God is explosive, hallelujah! And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming like an atomic bomb to that state called critical mass, hallelujah, when the world is going to begin to detonate, hallelujah, under the energies of love that were loose to Calvary, hallelujah. We're approaching critical mass in the end of the age. It's 
going to be the greatest explosion of salvational power. And it's going to be tidal waves set up that will cover whole nations. Hallelujah. And nations will be born in a day. Hallelujah. Now I'm getting extravagant. Hallelujah. Now we're beginning to speak the word of the Lord. You have not come to the kingdom to see the king of kings capitulate to the dark prince. Hallelujah. But you have come to see Jesus in his historical work of salvation. And when he is planted upon the Praying high died in 1900, shouting in Hindi, Jesus is victor, Jesus is victor, and prophesying of the 20th century. He said this century will show the coming forth of a double portion of Holy Ghost power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've got to shout. I've got to talk about it. I've got to say what the Spirit of Jesus in me wants to testify of. He wants the world to know and to capitulate to his Lordship that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. You know, there are two aspects in the gospel. There is the charisma and there is the didache. Didache is teaching, but charisma is declaration, proclamation. Hallelujah. I cannot give myself to teaching. I've got to declare... I've got to tell about his name. Hallelujah. I've got to talk about what's in heaven and laid up for the saints. Hallelujah. I've got to talk about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That is his royal dominion. Hallelujah. You know what kingdom is? It's king dominion. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The very ends of my extremities in the river of God. Hallelujah. You know, Oral Roberts spent many frustrated years in a powerless position. And he said for years and years and years before that great calling unfolded, he, he said he felt like there was power just at his fingertips. He felt it, he sensed it, but he couldn't lay hold upon it. And all of a sudden, as I stood there with my little Bible, I still remember everything I had on, a pair of cordovan shoes, pair of slacks of a certain character that was sort of an odd, real full in the legs and they had pleats in them in you know, old fashioned. I think I had a turquoise colored sport shirt on. I had a little sport jacket that was rust colored and had something across here. I can, oh, I'll never forget the night. I'll never forget the time. I'll never forget the meeting with God. It was my Kaddish Barnea, my sanctuary in the wilderness of wanderings, the holy place where the Lord was seen high and lifted up. Hallelujah. And as I stood there, there's only one thing I can't remember is what socks I had on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God, but that's not important. <laughs> For the presence of God is where you take off your shoes and off your feet. Praise God. And all of a sudden, a bolt of power out of heaven struck me just like a bolt of lightning. And threw my body as far as from about that chair over to that wall, into the wall of the tent. And my body went into the tent wall. The tent wall naturally heaved me down into the sawdust. And I found myself in a new world. I couldn't get up off the ground. One moment I was totally lucid, intellectual, mental, under self-control, knew everything was me, the same old me. Do you ever get tired of being the same old me? And when I was on the ground, my body bent over double and I couldn't, I couldn't straighten my body up. And so I thought, a fear ran through me. I thought, good grief, I've, uh, I've pinched a nerve or crushed a disc or I've, I've got a back injury. Now I've done it. <laughs> I was 20 years old and I was in very good physical condition. So I tried for 20 straight minutes to get up on my feet. And every time I tried to get up, a powerful force from ex heaven hit me like an explosion. And every time I was getting everything under control, getting it together, as you say, this force would hit me and roll me over. And that must have happened 50 times. And I was frustrated. I was wrestling against the power of the Holy Ghost, just like all the Jews did for many generations. Stephen said, as your fathers did, so do ye. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. And I was resisting the Holy Ghost and trying to overcome this thing. And then after 20 minutes, I had $3 and maybe 35 cents of change in this pocket. 
I turned over enough times that every single penny fell out. There wasn't anything in my pocket when I got up. But all of a sudden, a clearness came over my conscience. I thought to myself, this must be the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I was scientifically minded as, a, as an individual. And when that thought came across my mind, I remembered why I was there, came to get the baptism. And I mean, there was great fear in that hour. There was a tremendous fear. God's, God's fear was upon me. I was gripped in the fear of God. And so I said, God, <clears throat> give me a definite experience. And when I said that word, all of a sudden I began to speak in other languages so powerfully and so clearly, just like it is today. And in that moment of time, when I began to speak in other tongues, I suddenly became violently drunk. Just like that. It was, it was nothing, see the service was already over, I was having this all by myself there. And there were Pentecostal people standing around watching me. People were above looking down, you know, gawking at me. I knew that. But I became suddenly and violently drunk. And I, when, when I spoke in tongues, clearly, then the Lord let me get up. And I got up. And when I got up, my legs just ran, and I ran, and I leaped, and I shouted, and I, I suppose I made like Brother Taylor said, a total fool of myself. I was so violent that somebody said I even offended some back seven Pentecostal preachers that were there, and they were going out from under the tent. That's what somebody told me. I don't know if that's true or not. They said those, you see those guys back there said they're back seven Pentecostal preachers, and they're, they're offended by, you know, your violence. Praise God. But I was turned into another man in a moment of time. And as I said in the classroom, I can't remember what it was like really before. And the next night was Friday night, and that night I was in a car with a bunch of other people, and all of a sudden a young man who was about 35 turned around and prophesied to me a tremendous word, which I probably won't share because it's of its nature. Hallelujah. But you see why I remember? That's 19 years ago. I've been seeking the Lord before that. Five, six, seven years before that, the Lord began to draw me in. And I'm remembering the word that the Lord said. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Go in this thy might, the might of that word. Now something happened to this man, Caleb, over that 45-year period. Because when he entered upon that period, he had a spiritual capacity to embrace a word or reach around a word. And at the end of that period, he was able to come to Moses or Joshua and say, Now therefore give me this mountain. He'd become so big in his spiritual nature that he was able to reach around a mountain. He came to, he came to Joshua and says, Give me my dominion. Hallelujah. I'm ready to rule and reign. 85 years old. Hallelujah. And the Bible says here in verse 10, Behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these 40 and 5 years, even since the Lord spake this word. People little realize the substance of the word of God. The word of God is substantial. It is substantial with heavenly materiality. Not of this creation, not of this nature, a transcendent reality, a pre-existent reality, but it is substantial. I believe there's a scripture Brother Taylor is fond of quoting and probably do well to quote it just now. It's in, I think it's in Proverbs chapter 8. Praise God. I've seen him quote it a number of times just recently. Listen to what God says, or the, it's, it's the Word himself speaking in chapter 8 and verse 20 of Proverbs. I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the paths of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. You get heavenly substance in you, there's going to be heavenly results in this earthly plane. Hallelujah. 
Praise God. Hallelujah. And I want to <clears throat> just pick out a couple of New Testament areas here. Hallelujah. Remembrance brings spiritual enlargement. The trouble and the difficulty and the adversity brings spiritual enlargement. And as you hold the word that the Lord has given to you, it, 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 it puts you into this state of what I call the nourishment of spiritual communion. God will feed your spiritual man by the word, by your daily face-to-face -face communion with it. I believe that every day of those 45 years, Caleb remembered the word that the Lord spoke by Moses, a man of God. That there's a mountain waiting for you in Canaan land. That there's a part of the kingdom for you. That there's a place in the throne for you. That you're going to rule and reign as a king because you honored me and fully obeying me. You know, it's a terrible thing to try to exalt yourself in the church. You'll come to nothing, come to wreck and ruin. But if the Lord wills to exalt you, you will be lifted up. You will be lifted up if God wills to exalt you as a leader or whatever caliber you're going to be. Look at James chapter 1. Hallelujah. Verse 21. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise God. Are you weary sitting there? Hallelujah. If anybody, any time is ever weary, I'm probably real easy to shut off. I'm like a radio. I've got control. The Bible says the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophets. I don't want to keep an audience too long. It's going on a little late here. But this is a tremendous thing to me because I'm preaching out of experience. This is what I have lived. I am living this now. I'm somewhere in it now. I'm somewhere between Gilgal and Hebron. Hallelujah. Where are you? I believe you're there with us too, praise God. Because we're all one body. Aren't we one body? Amen. Amen. James 1 and 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. See, that's what Israel needed in the wilderness. They needed the saving of the soul. Because in Israel's baptism in the Red Sea, they were delivered from Egypt and all that that implies. You've heard a lot of uh, allegorical preaching on that. Save from sin, save from the uh, powers of the lower realm, save from slavery, save, save from servitude to the, the, the baser entities of life, elevated above, brought into the wilderness. But in the wilderness was the arena of the display of self. And self just had a field day in the wilderness and rebelled against God every occasion. Isn't that right? But when you go through the Jordan, you get deliverance from self. For death is swallowed up of life. Hallelujah. Praise God. Your humanity is swallowed up in his divinity in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he overshadowing his presence. Hallelujah. And so, three million Israelites fell victim to self. Two, who had a different spirit, the Bible takes pains to explain, they overcame self. You see, the Israelites allowed their rebellion to dictate their course of life, to wander in the wilderness 40 years. And I sat there thinking tonight, I am now 40 years old this year. What, what, what kind of a mentality would I have if I had been spending every year of these 40 years in a, in a desert, uh, parched wilderness like Israel? I would have a wilderness mentality, wouldn't I? But Caleb held this word to his bosom for 45 years. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. And he looked at the word and nodded the wilderness. With three million Hebrews, their rebellion determined their destiny. Dust, white, rotting bones in the wilderness, that was their destiny. They determined it by their response to grace. Caleb's destiny was determined by the obedience of faith. You know, it's not optional to you and me tonight whether we believe God or not. We must believe God. We are compelled to believe God. 
Hallelujah. And James says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Out of three million, two did the word and three million heard the word. Hearing the word is not enough. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. And for many years I looked into that in a, an old uh, order of religion and aspect. I, I took it to mean this, that every time I read the Bible it convicts me of my sin. The show me I'm a no good, rotten, low down, miserable, defeated sinner. But after I lived a few years, God gave me a revelation one night. And I preached it the first time, probably in 1960, 61. Down in a little obscure assembly got church in the uh, Tuscarora Mountains, I think it was. Somewhere down in Pennsylvania. And I remember preaching on God's Superman for the first time. For I found out by revelation that when you look into the Bible, you not only see that you're a sinner, but you're, that you are a potential son of God. Hallelujah. Get John's gospel and read the first chapter if you don't believe it. Yes. Hallelujah. I know you believe it, but we're reinforcing tonight. We're emphasizing. We're repeating. And we're, we're attaining perfection by repetition. When I heard Yasha Heifetz's violinist perfection on the stage of Carnegie Hall, I, I realized that this was the perfection born of endless repetition. We must repeat and repeat and repeat this word of victory that the church come unto this level of dominion and power God has eternally willed for it. And you see, most people see themselves as an overcomer in the pages of Scripture. And they go their way and they start rubbing shoulders with all the rebellious Israelites and it makes them forget. Hallelujah. I'm going to read something that's appropriate right now. It's not appropriate to the general movement in the country, but it's appropriate in my heart. Shun the polluted flock. Live like that stoic bird, the eagle of the rock. The huddled warmth of crowds begets and fosters hate. He keeps above the clouds his cliff inviolate. When flocks are folded warm and herds to shelter run, he sails above the storm. He stares into the sun. Hallelujah! Glory to God! Will you be God's eagle saint and put forth your wings of prayer and praise and catch the mighty updraft of the Holy Ghost that is moving in our generation, hallelujah, and enter into the upper realms of God's revelation. For the eagle has an eye that is designed with a special lid to stare directly into the sun above the clouds of this atmosphere where the sun is many fold brighter than it is down here. Glory to God. I'm exhorting you in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost to rise above your puny selves. Rise above the wilderness characteristics and believe God to take this land. Oh, hallelujah. There's a mountain in this land with your name on it. Glory. There is a coming together in the eternal purpose of God, so much so that God has a personal word for everyone. Hallelujah. Yes. The nourishment of spiritual communion in communing with that word that was given. Hallelujah. Look at this other proof scripture here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Glory to God. Why do I have to shout? Praise God. What is this that's got a hold of me? Can you define for me philosophically that which has got a hold of this people and is driving us and driving us and motivating us unto perfection? Hallelujah. Oh, the goal of heavenly vision that the preachers are preaching and prophesying since the latter rain began to fall, I am persuaded it is a reality. And no mere dream of the night. Listen to the scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He said, I am. He's saying tonight to us through that scripture, I am thy liberty. In other words, there is no liberty but in the God element. Enoch walked with God. How? In God. In the Spirit. By the Spirit. Hallelujah. Motivated by God's own life. And God cries out in one of the Psalms, I believe it's 82. He said, oh, that Israel would live my life. But we all, Paul goes on, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. 
even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And when you have experiences that are born of the Spirit, there is the glory of God in that experience to make you the man that can measure up to the experience. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Here in James is communion with the Word. And here in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians is communion with the Spirit. Letting our spiritual man be nourished by beholding his glory. You know, I believe that this week, because there's been a heavy anointing moving here, that there's been a profound change take place in us. And do you sense that we move together more unifiedly now than we did at the first of the week? We have come into something. This body can move almost like a church that's grown up together for 40 years, as though we know each other. Sense the spirit. There's a sensitivity. There's a quality of life that's been manifested. It's rare. You can't just go anywhere and walk in and find this. This is the thing that people have wept over and agonized over and fasted and prayed for and didn't see. And here it is, offered by grace, sovereign grace. Not because you're you, but because he's him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there's another beautiful scripture on communion that I just love. I love to sing it. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who's talking? Jesus, the living word. The word of God said, I want to come into your heart so that I can change you from within. The inwrought word that wants to dwell richly in you in all wisdom and spiritual songs, prophecy, poetic declaration of the beauty of God's being. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. I will feed on his substance. And he with me, and he will feed on my substance. I don't know how it is in the economy of God and man incorporated that God likes to feed on what you are, and we must feed on what he is. Hallelujah. That's fellowship. That's fellowship. Hallelujah. And now... Praise God. Caleb says to Joshua, he says, God has kept me alive. As he said, these 40 and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. But when Caleb came out of the sanctuary at Kaddish, he did not wander anymore. He was waiting. Three million wandered in confusion. Caleb was there because he was an Israelite also, and he had to wait until they died. Possibly one reason the breakthrough has not come sooner, God has been waiting while a generation of unbelieving Pentecostals died. Ever think of that? Moses waited 40 years for a bush to burn while the cup of the iniquity of the Amorites and the other nations was full, was filled. When Moses went to the wilderness, their cup of iniquity was not yet filled, and he had to wait 40 years while their cup was filled up. That's one proof we can find right in the text of the Bible. We don't know what other reasons why Moses might have had to wait. Praise God. Do you see how clear it is? Caleb, because he had the word, the mission, the calling, the commission, and the anointing, he did not wander anymore. He knew who he was and where he was bound for. He absolutely knew he would stand on the other side of Jordan, though Moses himself didn't make it. Praise God. And Caleb says, As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Forcible. The kingdom of heaven is pushing itself with force since John's days, and the violent are taking it as a booty. Hallelujah. Seizing it as a prize. For there is a tremendous divine human satanic conflict set up. Glory to God. He says, as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war. For war, hallelujah. You received that word for war, Timothy, Paul says. Remember the prophecies that came under this reliable presbytery of apostles and prophets that by these words you might fight a good warfare. God wills victory for his sons. Amen? Amen. 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 Both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain. Spiritual enlargement is spoken of 
in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6, 11, 12, 13. Paul said, oh, Corinthians, our hearts are enlarged unto you. Let your hearts be enlarged unto us, spiritual enlargement. And God cries through the prophetic song of Isaiah to pull up your tent stakes and make, make bigger the, the place of your tent. Spiritual enlargement by communing with the word. Hallelujah. Caleb says, I have grown, Caleb, Joshua, since you and I started out together in the history of this enterprise, I have grown. He said, that day I had room in my heart for a word. There's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man. It may only be big enough to hold a seed, but it's there. Let that vacuum in your heart, that God-shaped void, be filled with the seed of his word. And lo and behold, Caleb has expanded. He's, he's had spiritual enlargement. He says, now today, Joshua, I can embrace the mountain. I've got room in my being to hold the mountain. I can handle the dominion. I'm mature now, Joshua. I have seen the goal before me. I've lived these years for it. This is my reason for being. Now, Joshua, give me this mountain. And in that mountain, there was a city called Kiriath Arba, a city of four giants. You may have four gigantic, miserable, wretched uh, traits in yourself, in your flawed character that you've got to overcome or slay. I'm not going to go into the allegory of that tonight. But he took that city called Kiriath Arba and changed the name to Hebron. Hebron means the place of fellowship. Overcoming brings fellowship with the rest of the overcomers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Bible says at the end of the chapter, the land had rest from war. Praise God. By and by, when the battle's o'er. We used to sing that in the old deliverance revivals. Glory to God, I say, glory to God, I say, glory to God. Oh, it's in my heart to overcome. Hallelujah. To believe God and to cast out every doubt and fear. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. Do you have that drive for perfection in your being? Amen. Amen. That's the God part in you. Follow your heart. Follow your heart, I say. Hallelujah. I want to turn this over to somebody else now. We can sing and praise the Lord. Brother Tony, could you, could you be a helper at this time? Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't know what to do now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Why don't we sing that again? The Spirit of the Lord is here.